Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the families, thank you for joining us today to celebrate and remember, to cherish the lives of two incredible young men whose lives have left an indelible imprint on all of us. Look, look around the room, look at the life, look at the legacy, look at the impact of these two lives. Speaking of that, um, if you are a high school student and you wanna be a hero, there are some people standing along the walls who will, will just say they're not high school students anymore. And if you would love to give up your seat, now it's an opportunity for you to be a hero. Uh, on behalf of our church, Access Church, we're honored you're here. I kind of thought this room might not be big enough, but the family insisted that it be here. So it is an honor to host you and your family as we remember two incredible lives today. A couple days ago, I met with Katie and her two mothers, and we, we talked about today, and I made a mistake. I, I asked her, I said, just tell me a little bit about Aaron, tell me a little bit about AJ, and then I didn't talk for about 45 minutes because their lives made such a difference. She was talking about AJ, and she said this, every picture of AJ has a huge smile has a huge smile and I love it. And so I just went onto social media and I looked and she was right, every picture has a huge smile because the word that feels like it probably best summarizes his life is the word, the word bright. Every part of his life was bright. In fact, the reason that we're wearing these yellow ribbons today is a reminder of his favorite color, but it's not just his favorite color, it is symbolic of this kind of person that he was a bright person. AJ was looked up to, respected, a servant leader, a dynamic leader, and a lot of people know him for some of what he did. He was an incredible drum major. But one of the things I love about him is this. Every leader knows that leadership isn't about authority and position. Leadership is about influence. And what I love about him is he would sit with every section of the band just to make sure that they felt seen, known, and loved. AJ was humble, and yet he carried authority, which is the greatest kind of leader. He was the same kind of person at home. He loved his brothers and sisters. He loved to shop with his Nana. He, he said this about his Nana. I like shopping with you because you let me take my time. You let me look around and you don't bug me. <laughs> Man, after my own heart. He, he was silly. And I don't know if all of us don't get a perfect purview into every part of a person's life, but he was silly. He would give Christmas concerts for his grandmothers in his Christmas pajamas. And this year, it was a robe. He was just always the life of every party. AJ had a special relationship with his mom, Katie. He, he would just hug on her, and he would invite her onto dates with him and his girlfriend. And <laughs> as someone who once dated, that's weird. And <laughs> he would say things like, what? It's not weird, you're my mom. And I would just respond, that's the weird part, but he did it. <laughs> he was so sweet, and he had a different kind of relationship with each one of his siblings. At his brother Caleb's first solo and ensemble, he helped Caleb work through his nerves because he cared about every part of his life. When Caleb got his first paycheck, he did something special for the family, and he did something special for everyone, he even used some of that money to take his grandmothers out to breakfast. What a guy. And one of the things that I loved, a recurring theme in his life, is he just lived open-handedly. Like everything he had just flowed through him, and it wasn't just about him. That was AJ. Aaron lived an extraordinary life, a big kind of life, the kind of life that you look around and you still see and you feel the rippling effect of his life. And he loved his life and he loved his family. He loved you. Katie said that they had kids at such a young age that it's hard for her to even separate the idea of him being anything ever than being a dad. He loved being a drum major and he loved that AJ was following in his footsteps. Uh, one of Katie's friends reached out and said, Aaron was my drum major. He took on challenges, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest about something. You know, I like most of Aaron, but I, I hate this about him. He could pick up any instrument and start playing it. Anyone else hate that? Anybody like, the good Lord, when he was handing out gifts, just straight up skipped me on the music part, but is what it is, I'll take it up with him someday. He, he passed on that same love that he had for music to his kids. Katie told me at one point his two boys had nine school musical instruments in their room. Nine, it's a lot of money. He. Aaron was a hands-on dad. He loved his kids, and he loved every kind of adventure he could do. At one point, they made kind of a rash decision. There was a job opportunity in California, 
And they made the decision to move their whole large family across the country in just eight weeks to pursue adventure and to take a different job. And that led them to other adventures like having Thanksgiving meal and Thanksgiving day on San Diego Beach. Aaron was entrepreneurial. He, he made AJ his infamous wooden bow tie. He, and that led to another business, which it tends to happen, a business called Anchor and Swan. And, and to do this, though, to start this business, he had to buy a laser cutter. Now, I don't know how much you know about laser cutters. I knew nothing before this day about laser cutters. Apparently, that laser cutter was a little larger than they expected. And by a little larger, I mean they had to move the kitchen dining room table out of the house because it was so big that there was no room. Aaron was a man after my own heart. He also wanted to start a cooking business, and so he bought two incredible meat smokers. And here was his idea. He wanted to start a store restaurant, kind of like Cracker Barrel, where on one side of the store he could sell his goods that he was creating, and on the other side he could sell his smoked meats. A man after my own heart. Um, the last project that Aaron worked on with AJ was they cut out something out of wood, a kind of an art piece for a school project. And nothing seems to summarize the relationship better than that. Always together, always dreaming, always laughing, always working on something together. One of the stories that most profoundly touched my soul as I was listening to these stories is this. As I was told that when AJ was born, the doctor handed AJ to Aaron. And if you know anything about holding a baby for the first time, you're so worried about everything. You're worried about dropping the baby. You are worried about hurting the baby. And Aaron just kind of had like a quiet little panic moment. He said, I don't, I, I, I don't know what to do. And I don't, I, don't know, I, don't know what to, I don't know what to say. And he looked at his mom and said, what am I supposed to say? And she said, he knows your voice. So say something or sing something to him. And so there in one of the first moments he had with AJ, He's saying what they are now getting to experience. They sang Amazing Grace, a song that reminds us that matter, no matter how far you are from God, he welcomes you back. And I thought it would be an appropriate way to start today by asking all of you to stand. Would you stand with me? If you know the words of the song, would you sing along? still standing, will you join me in prayer today? So God, thank you for your presence that's here. Thank you for the peace of God that surpasses all of our understanding. So in these moments that we need you, we, we love you, we trust you, we invite you to heal us. 
for all of us who feel like our hearts are broken into a million little pieces, we ask you to do what only you can do and to be our comforter. We love you and we thank you for that, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Like you, on Saturday when I got a call about what had happened, I felt sucker punched. I felt like that came out of nowhere, wasn't on my radar, and all of a sudden, I was just faced with the reality of life, that life is precious and it's short and it's here for a moment and then it's gone. And and I know you felt that way because I've talked to so many people in our church, in our community that have felt the same way. Why is that? It's because there is something about death that feels so final, isn't it? Isn't it on days like today when it feels like death has the final word? It's like we're staring eternity in the face. But when I was a kid, I grew up in South Florida in the West Palm Beach area, but my grandparents lived in Dallas. And so every year, only about once a year, would I be able to make my way to see them. And so we'd spend a week with them having fun. And then when we would leave, it was the same thing every single Christmas. We would get in the car on our way to the airport, And my grandmother would come out and she would start to cry, but not like a sweet cry, but kind of an ugly cry. Do you know what I mean by an ugly cry? That's when there's like bubbles and stuff just coming up out of everything. She would ugly cry. And I remember vividly, my dad would always roll down the window and it was the same conversation every time. My dad would say, mom, it's not goodbye. So I'll see you later. I'll see you later. And when you're a Christian, what's beautiful is these moments aren't final. These moments aren't goodbye. These moments are, I will see you later. It's really the only reason that I believe that the only word that feels adequate for days like today is the word bittersweet. It feels so bitter. You have questions and I have questions. It feels bitter. But there is a sweetness in knowing that this isn't goodbye. This is, I will see you later. You you ever had this experience? Have you ever been with someone who lived in a city for a really, really long time and when you go to visit their city, they drive around and they, they, they always do this thing where they point out buildings and they say, that, that used to not be there. They built that five years ago. And that used to be a cow pasture. You know what I'm talking about? That used to be an orange plantation, an orange field. And you ever had this? Some 10 or 12 years ago, I was in the Charlotte area with my wife and we were visiting her grandparents. And her grandfather was driving me around town and he did that thing that grandparents like to do. They were, he was showing me everything. That, that building, they built that four years ago. I'm like, I don't care. What are we talking about? But he's like, they built that four years ago. It used to be a cow pasture. I was like, cool. And that, that building, they, they just built that seven years ago. I remember when they built it and he told me details that nobody cared about. And then as he was going, he was like, cow pasture, just a little field. There was that, there used to be a soccer field where the kids would play. That's where they're going to bury me. That was a cow pasture. And I was like, whoa, 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 hold up. What? What do you mean? And he just kind of blew right past it. And I asked him why he just spoke so confidently about it. And he said this. He said, the truth is, we're ready. And he was old. He was in his 80s probably at this point. And he said, we're just, we're kind of ready for whenever that day comes. Why? Because he understood something. Here's what he understood. Death isn't the final word. Death is actually a doorway for Christians. It is not the finish line. It is the starting line to life eternally with God. And if days like today make you feel a certain way, if you feel like you're staring eternity in the face, you need to know that that is actually the imprint of God on your life. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, who was the wisest man to ever live, said it like this. It says he, he's talking about God, has planted eternity in the human heart. This was always God's intention. That this is the reason that you could go to the most remote villages and the most, most remote jungles in the world and you can find people who have no connection to an outside world worshiping something. It might be misguided. It might be a sun or a tree or an animal or something. But, but there is a part of the human soul that longs to be connected to something bigger and greater than itself. And the reason is God himself placed eternity in our hearts. Now, if you're like me, you have these moments where life hurts These moments where life doesn't feel fair, and like you, I've had plenty of those moments in my own life, haven't you? Today being one. And there is this temptation. The temptation is to ask, why? Why? And I bet if we were to go around the room, every single one in the room has had that moment with God. And whether you're a believer or not a believer, there are these moments of crisis that tend to turn our attention upward. We don't look down and say, why did this happen? We look up at God and we ask, why? But I'd like to submit to you today that why Why might be the wrong question? You could spend the rest of your life asking why and never get an answer that will satisfy you. A lot of us think things like, well, when I get to heaven someday, I'm gonna put God in a corner and I'm gonna ask him why. 
And I don't think why is the right question. I think the right question today is what? What? Here's what it is. It's what is the hope that we have? Because if you have no hope, today feels senseless. Today feels difficult. Paul wrote in a book called 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He said, and now dear brothers and sisters, and let me make this a little bit more personal. Let me say it to you. And now family and friends. And now Lakeland High School students. And now loved ones. Now people who deeply were impacted by these two lives, and now brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Here's what he's saying. There's, There's two different kind of audiences. There are some people who when they face death, it's like they grieve and grieving feels hopeless because it feels like this life is all there is, but there is a whole nother audience of people. And those are the people who have made the decision to surrender their life to the control of Jesus, to follow Jesus with everything. And here's what he says. He says, we have a different kind of hope so you don't have to grieve in the same way. Well, what is, what is the hope that all of us have? I wanna to submit to you it's this simple. Our hope is in heaven Our hope is that this life isn't all that there is to this life. Our hope is that as final as today might feel, that today is not the end of the race. Today is actually the beginning for Aaron and for AJ. I've heard it said that heaven is a special, incredible place. In fact, it's interesting to me that in Scripture, there's not a lot of verses on heaven. Jesus talks about it a little bit. I'll read something he said in a moment. But in Revelation chapter 21, it's interesting. John, who's writing Revelation, kind of the, it's the end of the Bible, he, he writes this, and the way he describes it is unique. He, he describes it not by what it is, but he can't describe what he's seeing, so he describes it this way. He says, in heaven there is no more something. He's not describing it by what it is. He's describing it by what it is not. Uh, some years ago, um, I had a friend named Nava, and I met Nava in Fiji. In a high school, I went three or four times to Fiji and Nadal was one of the sweetest, most incredible guys I've ever met. And so we were able to bring him to America for a year to study here and then send him back to do ministry in Fiji. Fiji, to most Americans, is a beautiful beach destination. And it has beautiful, pristine beaches. But it is also one of the poorest, most desolate places in the whole world. And so Nadal came, and I had the, the joy of picking him up at the airport. I picked him up, and, and I had to run an errand. And the very first place I went is I took this, this young guy from Fiji, who's coming out of desolation, <laughs> to Sam's Club. And, um, <laughs> and he, he walked in and he said, this, this is not Fiji, is what he said. And we walked around, and you've been to Sam's Club or Costco, there's food everywhere, and he said, ooh, this is not home. Ooh. Fiji, Fiji wouldn't know anything about this. He couldn't describe it. He could only describe it based on his own experience. And John describes heaven in this way. He doesn't tell us what it is, but he uses three phrases to kind of tell us what it's not. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, he says he, again talking about God, will wipe every tear from their eyes. And I want you to pay attention. He says there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. So you can say in heaven... There's no more death. And the reason that death makes us uncomfortable is we don't know when our day is, and we don't know how we're going to die. And what we tend to think is that life is what precedes death. But it's really not. Like, that's not the way it works in God's world. In God's world, it's really death is what precedes life. Death is a doorway into the resurrection life that God has for all of us. That this is the reason that if you grew up going to or living near an old country church, often by the old churches out in the rural areas, there would literally be a small church building and literally right outside or sometimes right in front of it was a cemetery. And I don't know if you've ever thought about that. That was not like their way to stop the church from growing. That, that was the reason for it was to remind the people who were coming to church that they had to walk through death symbolically to get to life. This is the hope we have. This is what heaven means. So the first thing is in heaven, there will be no more death. The second thing, Revelation 21, verse 25, he says, its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there is no night there. In heaven, according to John, there's no more darkness. And I want you to think for a moment about what darkness means. In the ancient world, cities would be built, and around the city they would build walls. 
And at night, they would close the gates of the walls to protect themselves because they knew that at night in the darkness was when the enemy would attack. In the same way, what he says about heaven is that heaven, there's no moments where you have to worry about stuff like that. You could say it like this, in heaven, there is no anxiety. In heaven, there is no depression. In heaven, there is nothing that you ever have to worry about. In heaven, there is no fear. And I love this. Um, one of my favorite family Christmas traditions every year is we gather around and we make popcorn and we sit and we watch the Charlie Brown Christmas movie. Certainly you've seen this before. And there's the famous scene where everyone's on the stage and they're supposed to put on some sort of Christmas musical and everyone's doing their own thing. And all of a sudden Linus, like the hero of the story, steps to center stage and the light hits him and he's holding his famous blanket, his security blanket. And he recites Luke chapter two, and he says, and there were shepherds out in the fields. And all of a sudden, there's that moment where the angels appear and the glory of the Lord shone around him and they were afraid. And what does he do in the moment? He lifts his blanket of security. And he says what the angels say, don't worry, we bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the city of David, a savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. And when they say you don't have to be afraid, he symbolically lets it go. Okay, how incredible would your life be if that is how you lived every moment of your life? Not afraid of loss, not afraid of pain, not afraid of mental torment, but you could live free, free from hurt, free from being scarred. Imagine a world where the walls that you built up to protect your soul could come down so that you could be known and so you could be loved. Final thing is this, Revelation 21 verse 27. It says, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who, who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. In heaven, what he's saying is there will be no more disorder. It's that which was done in Genesis chapter one and two is undone in Revelation 21 and 22. Essentially what it means is all of the chaos and all the dysfunction and all these moments that make no sense to us at all, all of these moments will be undone once and for all. And so what you experience is this, Jesus is coming to replace death, darkness, and disorder with life and light and peace. This is what heaven is, and this is our hope. Jesus talks about heaven in John chapter 14, and I love how Jesus says it. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. In fact, I think that I could have built a whole message around those few words for all of us today. When you're sitting here and your heart feels heavy, when it feels broken into a million irreparable pieces, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. He says, you believe in God, but believe also in me. He says, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Let me say this to you. I know in a room this size, there's all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds with all kinds of beliefs, and yet all of us are staring at the same reality of eternity. And the promise that Christians cling to, the promise that gives us hope that this life isn't all there is, is what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you alone, and I'm leaving for a purpose, and here's the purpose, to prepare a place, heaven for you, that you may be with me forever in that place where there is no more death, no more darkness, and no more disorder. I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you alone. I'm going to do something. I'm coming back for you. And he uses this interesting word. He says that I'm going to prepare a place for you. I wanna end this message portion with this one simple thought. Heaven is a prepared place for people like Aaron and AJ whose hearts are prepared for heaven. And maybe you came today and you don't know if your heart is prepared for heaven. Well, what does it mean? Well, it simply means this. Heaven is reserved for people who have made the decision to surrender control of their life to the lordship of Jesus. And it would be a mistake. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to take a moment in this moment to examine your own heart, to ask the question, if today was my day, if today was the day that I met my end, if today was the day that, that my life on this side of eternity came to an end, do I know where I would spend my eternity? And if you don't, here is your moment. I'm gonna ask you in this moment, would you just bow your head and close your eyes with me all across this room? And I wanna give you a moment to experience the hope of Jesus. 
I want to give you a moment to know once and for all that if your life were to come to an end today, that your life would just be the doorway to heaven, that death would precede your next breath. You would take one breath on this side of eternity and step into the presence of God forever in heaven, the place where there's no more death, no more darkness, and no more disorder. If you're staring eternity in the face and you think to yourself, I don't know if I'm right with God, but today I want to make things right with God, I'm going to ask you in your own heart and with your own words to repeat this prayer after me. I want you to hear me say this. Praying a prayer doesn't change anything unless you mean it with all of your heart. So with your own heart and your own words, would you pray this with me? Would you say, Jesus, today, I surrender my whole life to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. So Jesus, you take control and I'll follow you. Jesus, we believe that you are the Son of God who because of your sacrifice on the cross bought our forgiveness once and for all. And so Jesus, today, we wanna make sure our hearts are aligned with you. So take over our lives, forgive us of our sins, and we submit our control of our life to you once and for all. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you, if you just made that decision, it is the most important decision you can ever make, and our church is here for you. We'd love to help you so that you can begin to walk in that different kind of hope, the kind of hope that only Jesus can offer. I bet you, if we had 24 hours or 48 hours or honestly looking around the room, if we had a whole month, we could sit around and tell story after story after story of the impact of the lives of Aaron and AJ and how they've made a difference in our own lives. There is no possible way to ever properly or adequately summarize these lives. But the family has invited five different speakers, Tim, Colby, Jamie, Virgil, and Luke, to come share their stories. I'm gonna invite them, all five of them, to come up. We've asked them to share their stories and if possible, to somehow share it in less than two minutes, which would be a miracle in and of itself. So if you were in the room, I'm gonna ask the five of you to come forward now. We should have gotten you better seats. That's what we should have done. Come on up. Thank you. It's on. All yeah, right. sure. Yeah, it's fine. Hi. My name is Virgil. Aaron was my brother. AJ was my nephew. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for my name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. On behalf of the family, I would like to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for coming today to this celebration of life for Aaron and AJ. I was asked to, uh, if I would like to share special memories or favorite things about Aaron and AJ, what kind of persons they were. But I don't have to. As I look around and see all of you, I don't think I even have to explain how amazing they were. Your sheer number attests to that. But I'll try to give my perspective on these two, on these two men. AJ was one of the most interesting people I've ever known. Why are all of you here? Because he was popular? No, it's because he was an amazing young man. He was as close as you could get to being a rock star without actually being in a rock band. He has always had a, a voracious appetite for reading. And when he was very little, he would always be reading the most mature stuff like The Lord of the Rings and all the Harry Potter books and all that kind of stuff. He always had a unique style, always being himself. It's hard to describe, right? It's like he was the coolest kid ever, but he didn't even try. I'll never forget when their family moved back to Florida and AJ started going to Southwest Middle School. He just decided to join the band and within the year was excelling in music. Then when he moved up to Lakeland High School, he completely excelled at all the things. And he was always just so down to earth 
and obviously just a shining example of a young man of God. <clears throat> How do I know he was a man of God? I was there when Aaron led AJ to Christ in prayer. I'll never forget that. Above all else, AJ loved. Was he perfect? No, no one is. But he lived out his faith. Love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 7. Aaron James Bates was born December 17, 1981, and he was my best friend that whole time. I'm sure I was, I was the first person he told that he was going to ask Katie to marry him. I'm pretty sure I was the first person he told that they were pregnant and with who would become AJ, and he even called me at four in the morning to tell me AJ been, had been born. Did we talk every day? No. Did we talk every week? No. But if we ever need anything, but if we ever needed help with something, or we had some big news, we would always be the first the other called. Aaron was a, hat, a man of many hats, all the familial hats, husband, father, son, brother, cousin, nephew, grandson, the friend hats, all the career hats, all the music hats, and quite literally a man of many actual hats. <laughs> Aaron's belongings include a plethora of hats, hats he picked up along the way and hats he made. And each hat has a different story. Maybe that's why it keeps them to remember the story. And a hat is a tangible way to enjoy a memory, an experience, something that makes us who we are. And I think I must understand that too because I've got a million hats as, as well. Uh, we were so different and yet so much the same. We both knew God had a greater purpose for our lives, even if it wasn't happening exactly the way we thought it would. God doesn't just leave a letter in your mailbox giving you a to-do list of everything he wants you to do. It requires believing that Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It requires drawing near to him daily. And Jesus said to, the, Jesus said to all, if anyone come, would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It requires obeying that still small voice inside, even when it's the most difficult thing to do. <clears throat> Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, even with life hurts. But we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. We must endure to the end, but we can't do it alone. Let us hold fast the confession, the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day of Christ drawing near. Hebrews 6 talks about why we should believe God's promises because he always fulfills them. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness and to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through the faith and patience inherit the promises. And in verse 19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul I hope. We must have hope. But we do not want you to be informed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do or have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself 
will descend from heaven and with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We must, we must have love. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Love one another. We're all sad right now, and we just need to love each other. It's okay to be sad. This, this hurts. Don't be sad for Aaron and AJ. They're in the presence of God. Indeed, when Christ returns, we won't be sad either. God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain, for these things have passed away. Yes, my heart is breaking, but I know I will see them again. Good afternoon. Uh, I recognize many of you may not know who I am, but I'm Colby. I was a friend of Aaron's. I, sharing some memories that I had with Aaron. It, it, I'd just like to start with the beginning. I first met Aaron last year during summer. If you knew, he had gone to the Florida, Florida State Leadership Camp. It wasn't until the second day of that camp that we were encouraged to go around and really start to get to know people. While there, sitting in that room, I looked around and I was trying to decide, well, who do I want to go to first? And I kind of looked towards the center of the room and all I see is this big mop of poofy blonde hair. <laughs> and I said, I want that person to be my friend for the rest of camp. And I had no idea who he was, no relation, no nothing, but I just knew he had this energy around him that I knew I wanted to get to know him. So I walked up, I introduced myself, and we kept talking, and we kept talking, and then eventually we got to the subject, what band are you from? He told me he was from the Lakeland High School Band. My jaw dropped, I screamed. I said, Aaron, I am from Bartow High School. <laughs> and we became instant friends for the rest of that camp. <laughs> that friendship, I believe, was founded on two things. One, both our love for music and band, and two, the hatred for each other's bands. <laughs> so to make that long story short, I traveled 230 miles to meet someone that lives less than 20 minutes away from me. <laughs> but I, I, I wouldn't change anything, not for the world. The next time I met Aaron, I get, or saw him, I should say, was at the preseason crank-up show at Lakeland. He had invited me and I just felt honored to go, to know, okay, well, this friendship didn't just fall apart. It was nice to see that he had remembered me. That's something that kind of sat with me for a while. And I got there, and then I realized it was a trap. He had intended for me to go into the drill down and embarrass myself, <laughs> which I did, but it, he did it with a smile. And that smile was so contagious that it led on to me, and it became one of my favorite memories of him. After the show was over, I, I stuck around because being a drum major, you always want to find something to do that you can help. Many of you may be able to relate to that, maybe not. But it's something that comes with the, with the job. Well, towards the end of what was taking place there, I asked Aaron, Aaron, do you want to go eat? I want to go eat something. And he said, yeah, sure, but we need to go ask my parents first. It was my first experience 
with Ms. Bates and Mr. Bates. I want to say when I met them, I had never met a more caring, more sweet, more accepting family. And I had only spoken to them for three minutes total. Aaron asks, do you mind if we go out to eat tonight? And they say, sure. But you're going to have to help clean up with the concession stand first. So to explain that a little bit, that's how I got recruited as a temporary member of the Lakeland High School Band. <laughs> um, that was quite fun, so thank you for that. I do, yeah. <laughs> so we were done, right? We, we finished, everything's cleaned up, everything's packed in. So we're walking out to my car, because I had offered to take AJ. And he looks at the two, these two cars that are parked right next to each other. And he looks at one of them. And one of them is this matte black car. It's kind of dirty. And then there's this other really nice car. And he looks at it. And he says, man, that, that, that car's paint job. It kind of looks like a chalkboard. It looks like you could just walk up and just start drawing on it. And I chose that moment to walk up, stick my key in that car, turn it, <laughs> and then watch as his face flushed. <laughs> And we, we got in, we, we were laughing the whole way to, of course, the Waffle House. <laughs> uh, two of which, uh, two of his friends attended with us, who are both in this room right now. I, I just want to say that night went on to become one of the greatest nights of my life. Thank you for trusting me with your son 10 minutes after meeting me for the very first time. We went on that night, and nobody was ready to leave when we were done eating, not one of us. So what did we do? We just started walking and talking, laughing, and enjoying the, the time that we were spending together. So we're walking down South Florida. And all of a sudden, I hear this maniacal laughing coming from behind me, and I turn to look right as Aaron starts sprinting across South Florida into the pu Publix parking lot. And I was a little confused, but I just ran after him, and that, and that was something I can't forget because his hair was just bouncing the whole way across that street. <laughs> I'm going to go a little off my script very quickly because this is something I hadn't thought to speak of. If you look over here towards the band, not only are they all in uniform, you see members of other bands here. The music community is a very tight community. We stick together as we are. We look out for our own. I don't believe that someone at, like Aaron would see this and be upset or sad. Aaron would see this and he would say, well, why, why, why me? I mean, this is, this is fantastic, but why just for me? And I would say to that, Aaron, it's because we feel the love. He had such a radiance about him, something I, 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 I could ask for every day and never truly achieve. But to bring people from our community like this, it's, it's something unchangeable. It's something you can't get anywhere else. The memory of these two great men reminds me to live on. It reminds me to live like to the fullest and love like there's no tomorrow. I encourage you to move on in happiness and not in sorrow, for that is what they would encourage us to do. That I know. I want to leave you today with a quote from someone I believe that was very, very highly respected by AJ. And this quote, I believe, embodies both what he most believed in and what his family stands for. And I quote, it is not about what it is. It is about what it can become. The one slur, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Thank you. There's a hundred more of those stories sitting all in this room. That's the beautiful thing. So, my name is Luke Hart, and I am the director of bands at Lakeland High School. 
And it truly is an honor to be here today to share a few words about Aaron and AJ. And I have it scripted, so band directors like to talk, so I, I made sure I put the words down. So I said everything. As I was preparing what to say today, I was, I was consistently at a loss for words. I stared at a blank sheet of paper thinking, how can I possibly find a way to articulate and honor Aaron and AJ? And the truth is, yeah, I mean, you, you can't. You kind of have to experience them. So I'll do my best to show you who they are to me and to my students. I had the privilege of becoming part of the Bates family when I started teaching at LHS three years ago. Katie and Aaron were the first family to welcome me with open arms. We shared birthdays, anniversaries, Christmas parties, and we just had some great times of fellowship. I remember through my first year, Mr. Bates would never ask me what he could do to help. He would just start helping. <laughs> he would find a need and then find a solution. He would show up to school on game days with food for me, you know, in his hands because he knew that on Fridays I never, I never ate anything. So he would just, he wouldn't ask what I want. He would just show up with food that you need to eat. Um, there was a need, and he provided, he found the solution. This process was served time and time again. He taught me not just to be present, but to get involved, be involved. He was the first to arrive and the last to leave. Aaron is selflessly devoted to his family, friends, and the Lakeland community. His passionate, creative, ambitious, and incredibly proud of his students and his children. The pain is great. You know, and as I turned to God's word for sustenance throughout the week, I was drawn to Romans 5, 3 and 4. And that passage tells us to rejoice in our sufferings. And when I read that, I got angry. I remember walking into school on Monday with AJ's chair sitting in the room and his instrument sitting on it. And watching my kids come in, drop to the floor in tears. There's no rejoicing. As I continued to meditate on this verse, I believe I started to understand its true meaning for me. The whole verse states that we are not just to rejoice in our sufferings, but we are to know that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And like Pastor Jason and Virgil said, character produces hope. I decided then that I would find a way to rejoice in the suffering. I would choose to feel the pain, but also feel the thankfulness, the love, the community, appreciation, and to not take for granted the incredible kids that walk in my room every day. AJ is a shining light. He brings so much joy and passion and energy, almost too much energy. <laughs> like his dad, he overflowed with selflessness, creativity, and his desire for others. There are so many stories of this lived out every day, and I'm so thankful that I have these memories. This is where I rejoice in the suffering. When the shorts were way too short. <laughs> when he was throwing spacing sticks like javelins into the back of our band trailer. 
when we danced a Cotton Eye Joe <laughs> in the middle of our all-day hot rehearsal out at Bryant Stadium. That's where I rejoice. We watched the Lorax, his favorite movie. When he looked at me in the eye periodically throughout the year and said, Mr. Hart, I didn't take my medicine today. <laughs> my only thought then was to brace for impact. <laughs> Every time we end a rehearsal with our dismissal, every time we march into Bryant Stadium, every time we lie in the practice field, that's where we can rejoice. When the band started playing again, this is where I found hope. What is life without hope for tomorrow? I'm blessed to be part of that hope for tomorrow. Every time I stand in front of these kids, I'm encouraged and I find that hope. So the question keeps running through my mind now is, what now? Life is not the same. We've all been unified in this grief, this loss we all have in common. I say... We choose to take a play from Aaron and AJ's book. I say we love fearlessly. We set ambitious goals. And we find a passion and run to it relentlessly. Katie, Kayla, Nora Claire, Caroline, Parker, Faith, Know that you are loved. Know that your family and you are not alone. We are your family. There will be tough days ahead. Lean on those whom you love. We are not designed to go this alone. God has gifted us with community. We are your community. Thank you. I should have probably put this on something much bigger like everybody else did. We're going to get through this. Um, my name is Jamie, uh, for those of you who don't know me. I was blessed to be able to meet the Bates family over 10 years ago. Uh, through work, we traveled across the country where our kids played countless hours and we as parents became a village. We cooked dinners together. We went on excursions together. We had pool days, science projects, all the things that you could imagine we needed to do to entertain all of our kids in an apartment with a suitcase of toys and clothing. Um, we would babysit each other's kids so we could have those special date nights with our husbands. Um, and those are the memories that I cling to the most. AJ was the best big brother and helper. He was always helping Katie with what they called the littles. He loved doting on his brother and his sisters. I saw all the pictures of him carrying them on his back, and I just remember that <laughs> like it was just yesterday. And even at seven years old, when I first met him, his actions were remarkable. He was the epitome of the perfect big brother. Aaron was an awesome dad and husband. He would work all day and night, 12, 14 hours, and still managed to come home and get on the floor and play with his kids. And he would sneak a kiss to Katie too. With their crazy big family, as I'm sure all of you were, I was always in awe of how each and every single one of them played their roles and they played them perfectly. Now let's fast forward 
to about a year ago, and I had the opportunity to give AJ his first job. He's not seven anymore. He's 17. He was all grown up and excited to work, excited to save for college and for a car. He would go to school, band, and then he still managed to come and bring that big smile that we have all talked about today and that fantastic spunky attitude to Axe Caliber. He was fun and he was quirky. He was filled with such great ideas and ingenuity and hard work ethic. You see, AJ was a carbon copy of his dad. Aaron was always willing to help and lend a helping hand. He was funny, he was creative, and most importantly, like so many of us have said, he was selfless. He single-handedly kept Craft and Kitchen going during a difficult time, gave 100% of himself, regardless if it left him tired, exhausted, and drained. And he later led me to be able to achieve my own dream of owning a restaurant. Again, an act of selflessness. I will forever be grateful for them both and miss them dearly, as I'm sure you all will too. They were the type of men who left a lasting impression and made a difference in whatever they dedicated themselves to. And for that, we should celebrate their lives and all that they accomplished. I would like to end with this. Katie, our love and support still belongs to that village. And we will be here to help support you and dote on the Bates Bunch for as long as you need. They usually don't let me get this close to a microphone in a church, so I'm a bit uncomfortable. Um, as, as mentioned before, it also isn't fun to go towards the end um, with any time limit. Um, my name's Tim Darby. I'm the proud husband of a brilliant and supportive wife who's here today um, instead of being at work, and the father of two young men who I claim responsibility for most of the time. Uh, we all know it. Um, <laughs> I do not let my wife or anyone read anything I write until I speak. So she, you, and I are probably freaking out a little bit right now. Um, I'm an attorney, and I work for the NBA. That's all you're going to hear about me. I've argued before judges, juries, and my wife, <laughs> and been successful in all but one of those efforts. <laughs> this is the most difficult argument I will ever give. Now please give me a minute. Um, this doesn't feel quite right. Having never earned the honor of being a drum major, I'd like for all former and current band students to please Pay attention. I want you to participate loudly and proudly with my other drum major, Mr. Roth, if you please. Thank you. That's much better. <laughs> um, he found out about that this morning, too. So, I mean, that was, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, that's kind of how trumpet guys do stuff. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining me today. I mean, everybody said so much. All the words that I want to use and share have, have been used. However, uh, this has not been covered yet. I have a very specific rule. I do not attend memorial services. Whether you agree with that or not, that's my rule. Somehow in his continuing brilliance, Aaron through Katie found a way around this rule. <laughs> that's the Aaron I know and love. Thanks, bud. Now I've got to rewrite the rule. 
Regardless, the show must go on. Before I continue, I will admit being around this many band parents is making me quite nervous being out of uniform. Um, however, we move on as I think I've, I've graduated. I realize I'm speaking to many young adults here today who knew and loved Aaron and AJ so much. I'm old now. I lost a teammate when I was 16. He should have been in the NBA. I feel and understand some of the pain that you are feeling and that you are dealing with. I urge you, if you need help, if you need to talk to someone, please do. I know I did about this. This is not a sign of weakness. This is a sign of strength. If this is the only message you take away from my remarks, I've already done my, show, my job. So please, keep that to heart. The show must go on. Um, admittedly, I did not have the opportunity to meet AJ, other than in passing, a simple greeting. And that's a regret that I will forever hold. Um, because watching him on Facebook and all the activities as a brilliant student, as a brilliant student athlete, as a brilliant drum major, he did it all. Watching him made me tired. Um, being the old person again, um, it's easier to get tired. Um, however, one of my favorite moments, uh, because I did follow the Bates Bunch very closely, as a former Gator student athlete, knowing full well that Aaron and the Bunch are not Gators. <laughs> I must admit, seeing pictures of AJ on his campus tour at UF, and I believe some family members purchased merchandise. All right, our scholarship fund appreciates that. Um, it gave me a giant smile and a laugh. Um, the Gators would have been so lucky to have someone like AJ. But if I had to bet, and I'd bet the house on it. The Knowles were going to gain an unbelievable student, musician, and person. I met Aaron when we were freshmen at LHS. Uh, we both throughout, throughout lives were kind of lone wolves. We had a very close pack. Many good friends, however, within the pack it was different. We could pick up on conversations that we'd had a year ago, a month ago, a day ago, hours ago, and pick up right where we left off. So back to high school. Holy crap, we were scared. We were ugly. Um, I still am. Um, <laughs> so Aaron and some others that are creatives decided that if the drum line got hats, we were going to have hats. So as a creator, he helped create a couple of these. And thanks to my mother, she cleaned them up um, because they were pretty unwarm. Um, I think I know what that means on the front of that hat. I know what it says on the back of this one. And if anybody can read that, that's fine. If not, then we can explain it later. Um, many of us had been good musicians. We were all gifted. But none of us had the discipline thing like Aaron did. Not even close. Um, we know who we are. We'll grow up when we're ready. Hopefully never. Thank God we had Aaron. Aaron and Katie are high school sweethearts. I know a bit about that myself as I met my wife at a middle school band, band council kickball game. <laughs> you laugh, but it's true. Um, and I'm sure Mr. K or Mr. West may remember my strongly penned declaration of war that we sent to the Lakeland Highlands Band Council prior to the game. Being the people that we were, Southwest won. Regardless of that unfortunate outcome for the Highlands, I was blessed to marry my sweetheart as Aaron was blessed to marry his. Those trumpet section boys sure know how, how to find true love, and it's in the woodwind section. And we both <laughs> truly, truly did. The show went on. Aaron was a great student, and we focused on social, social studies a lot. Um, all that fun stuff, in my opinion. 
Math and science, not so much. So we weren't in those same classes. Uh, but we were very focused on that part of it. Our interest in civics, that's what old people call social studies, um, even led us to perform by playing taps in a round duet at veterans' memorial services while we were in high school. I'm almost as scared now as I was then. Um, I could not have done it without Aaron by my side. His passion for everything that he got involved in immediately got my attention. Looking back on it, it was just different. And I, made, I imagine the same was the case with AJ. I had one too many passions. As parents, we now refer to them as distractions. Uh, but at the time, um, it was just different with Aaron. The second I heard he was trying out for drum major, I thought to myself, this is a waste of time. He's going to be the pick. Are you kidding me right now? Um, and I imagine the same was true for AJ. Um, I caught him practicing before the audition one time in the locker room and remember him acting like he was caught doing something wrong. Sadly, we did not have phones back then, um, or that video would still be here. Um, we were in the pager days, uh, but I will never forget it. So Aaron and I had the opportunity to work in Washington, D.C. together. I had to, the opportunity to work the year before for Congressman Charles Kennedy, who is now our serving chief judge for the Florida Supreme Court. He's kind of a big deal and very, very smart and kind. So somehow um, I was invited back. And I'm skipping ahead because I heard two minutes and I'm at like 10. So all right. Um, so <laughs> after, my, after my initial stint in DC this summer, after our senior year, um, unbelievably, I was invited back to intern. Uh, um, so the office needed more help, and they were looking for an intern for the subcommittee on the Constitution, civil rights, and civil liberties. All I thought before I could even say anything back to that email was, Aaron. After meeting with his parents as well as mine to explain all that involved, this was not some elaborate scam where a parent pays a pays a kid's rent and expenses while they're not getting paid in another state or district in this case, Aaron signed on to be my roommate and partner in crime throughout that summer. The show was getting better. Upon arriving at the dorm room that we sublet at George Washington University, we were immediately not granted access. Off to a good start. Um, after a phone call or three from a payphone, We'll explain those to some of y'all later. Um, <laughs> we, got, we got entry and keys to our room. There was a lot going on in that room. Um, and I think one of the funniest things was we noticed when we entered, there was a sign at George Washington at the time. And other than the beautiful view of the White House, um, there were signs saying that smoking was only permitted in the windows if they were open, which, I mean, that kind of made sense to me. Um, at this point in our lives, this northerner stuff was wild, like we haven't been that far out. Um, and keep in mind, neither of us had ever smoked anything in our lives. So our first trip out after settling into our room as the smoke-free class of 2000, <laughs> some of y'all got that. Um, our first trip was at CVS, and we bought, I, I promise, we bought two corncob pipes. <laughs> I, it'll turn up. <laughs> um, at a CVS, and cheap fruit-flavored pipe tobacco. Only the, f yeah, it hurts, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> only the finest for these southern rookies. Um, Fortunately for all involved, it took us most of the summer to figure out how to light the dang things. <laughs> but we felt like political scientists, should there be such a term, holding a pipe as we philosophized. I worked in Rayburn. He visited us often. He was also in an annex as well as the Library of Congress. Our work story is different, uh, we're different um, on the ride home. 
uh, my work stories related to, that's a hat, um, an angry constituent about their plumbing, only to find out after about 20 minutes of screaming, they were not a constituent within our district. So I promptly provided them with the appropriate phone number. Meanwhile, Aaron's stories were, I read the Constitution today. Wait, what? The real one? Yeah. So then from that point on, his understanding and interpretation of that document was beyond a normal level. That young man, um, as a high school graduate, taught me the Constitution in and out before I started college, let alone law school. All thanks to him. The show went on. Other opportunities allowed us to view releases of movies because we were working for um, a ranking congressman. So with two extra tickets to watch the midnight premiere of The Patriot, I still have the VHS should anyone wish to borrow, um, that was right down our alley until we got out of the movie and realized the metro stopped running at midnight. <laughs> that was a long, foggy, yet hasty walk, sometimes a jog, depending on who was following us, um, through a very large park to find a cab to get back to Foggy Bottom. Seriously, that's what they call that area. We're a team, we made it, the show was rocking on. We had full access to the Capitol building, 24 hours a day. We could go wherever we wanted. Statuary Hall, um, down an elevator into a basement where secret treasures were discovered, some of which I knew about, um, none of which were taken, um, but things that, that we were able to see. And then we went from the bottom all the way to the very top of the dome, which is an extremely, extremely exclusive area usually only reserved for the best or for those who stayed up late enough. I believe we, we checked both boxes. Being there with him, those moments will never, ever leave me. Now, on to the high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, I would like to know if there are any federal agents in the crowd, uh, because this may be a confession. At some point during our internship, I came up with the idea that we should visit all of the national monuments at night to see the beautiful views, to see the land. Well, me being me, I turned that idea into us possibly, or possibly not, sitting in a certain someone's lap to see the best view <laughs> that exists in Washington, D.C. <laughs> or so I was told. The view Abraham Lincoln enjoys in perpetuity. <laughs> Aaron, and I, Aaron and I may or may not have scouted the routine and timing of security and then paid a tourist to take three quick photos of us at 2 a.m. with a disposable Kodak camera, possibly, possibly, on President Lincoln's lap and next to his feet. There may be pictures out there somewhere. They may be in this folder. Um, that's one memory I have every time I see a, a penny is what may or may not have happened that night. Um, <laughs> but, but it was something I will never forget, and that is by far the highest sculpture I may or may not have scaled. Um, so that's, that's a memory that I will never, ever forget, and that's one of the last messages that he sent to me. As we get older, we go through stuff, and like me and Aaron, we keep all of our hats. Um, Brittany hates it, and the attention that I'm providing her right now, um, but it, it, it means something, and his last message to me was, look what I found. Um, which was never public knowledge until then, and I don't know who he shared that with, but oh my gosh, what a memory. Aaron cherished being a husband and father. He made it look so easy with such amazing children and beautiful children. He made most of our dads look bad 
but for me, that was motivation. Let that continue to be motivation as a reminder to all of us. I was asked once, what are they going to say about you when you're gone? I truly didn't have an answer. I'm still not quite sure. What I do know is I hope and pray that half of what has been said about Aaron and AJ are said about me, let alone half the crowd. I pray that both of my sons continue to develop and be unbelievably genuine and kind people like Aaron and AJ were, because they were. My son, God willing, will celebrate his 12th birthday tomorrow. It's getting real, real quick. My wife got to see Aaron on Thursday, as she did often at the pharmacy. She saw him and heard about their upcoming trip and how excited they were. I wish I had. I will hold that forever. Sometimes being lone wolves, it also has its disadvantages as we get distracted in good ways. We call it focus, but we don't touch base with our pack as much as we should. So I encourage all of you to think of the most important parts of your life, whether it be committing a federal crime or um, in the future, and speak to that person in your pack. Aaron is part of my pack. He always will be. And I wish I had one more chance to talk. Thank you again, everyone here, for showing your love. Thank you to our current band members, AJ's friends, administrators, teachers, bosses, band directors. You are all part of this legacy. The Bates legacy must and will continue on, whether I take it on alone or with all of you. A lot of these words have been used, but we must continue what they have created with hard work, leadership, selflessness, kindness, and love. We love you, Bates family. We are all here for you. Aaron and AJ, good show. Well done. Much love until we see each other again. For the rest of us, the show must go on in their honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. In our last five minutes together, and when I say five minutes, I mean like, you know, real five minutes, not like two minutes like that, but... Um, <laughs> In our last five minutes together, I would like the opportunity to pastor you. And whether this is your church or not, everybody needs a pastor. And I'd like to pastor you because I'd like to talk to you for a moment about what do you do with the pain? And what do you do with the hurt? And what do you do with the loss? And what do you do with the sleepless nights? And what do you do with it? And I want to take you to one passage that I love. We've been talking about hope. I want to talk to you about how you can find joy and peace in these next few days that feel painful. Philippians chapter 4, Paul is writing from prison. And he's literally in a jail cell in the city of Rome, a place he wanted to get to to preach, but now he finds himself in prison, writing a letter called the Letter of Joy. And he says these words. He says, rejoice. And what a weird way to start. He's in prison, and he writes a word that's all about joy. And rejoice means find joy and then, like, redo it. Re-find some more of it. Rejoice. And he says, here's how you do it. It's you rejoice in the Lord. You need to understand where your joy comes from. Joy is never based on circumstances. Happiness is circumstantial. Joy comes from within, and it comes from the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And for those of you a little slower who missed it, I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And then he says this. Do not be anxious about anything. And if your heart is troubled, you're like easier said than done. He says, do not let your heart, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. And I want you to see what he says. He says, present your request to God. I'm gonna explain this for just a moment. He says, when you pray for peace, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray at a different kind of level. Most of us, when we pray, we pray these really simple, shallow prayers. God, help me. God, fix this. God, meet this need. God, do this for me. And then we feel a little guilty, so we throw in one good prayer request for someone else and, and help that other person who's struggling. Amen. That's our prayer, right? 
He says, but if you want to experience the peace of God that is available to all of us, supernatural peace, pray a different way, he says present. That word in the original language that he writes literally means to pray at the level of your insecurity. What does that mean? Pray what's underneath the prayer. God, help me. Well, why do you need help? God, heal my heart. Well, why is your heart hurting? And tell him the whole truth and everything that's inside of you. And then here's the promise, verse seven. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is the promise to you, this phrase here that will guard your heart literally was like an ancient phrase of a Roman soldier holding whatever the modern weapons was standing watch over you to make sure you're okay. And the promise of God is that if you'll pray in a different kind of way, if you'll actually reveal your heart to him, start with joy, find something to be grateful for. Your joy comes from him. And then if you'll pray and reveal your heart, the promise of God is that a peace that you can't even begin to describe will somehow overwhelm you. A peace that you can't get your mind around will change your life and you will walk in a different kind of peace. And so if you're here and you find your heart troubled, family, if you're here and you're struggling to put together and to make sense all of the senseless stuff, pray at the level of your insecurity and watch as the peace of God comes. So here's how we're gonna end today. I'm gonna end by praying for you. Aaron and AJ are with Jesus in heaven. Praise God, thank God for that. But I wanna pray for you because it's us here in the room, it's those watching online that our hearts maybe feel troubled. And I wanna pray for the peace of God which can only come from God to flood our hearts. And then here is how we're gonna end. After I pray, um, Pastor Ryan from our staff is gonna lead the family out because they wanna greet you in the lobby on your way out. And then the marching band is gonna come and they're gonna play the song we started with today, Amazing Grace, as we dismiss. Let me pray for us and then I'll call everyone up. So God, thank you, first of all, for two incredible lives that have profoundly, deeply impacted all of us. And God, my prayer is that the, their memories will never be forgotten, that we'll take parts of what they've done and the ways they've impacted us and we'll continue to impact the world. And God, my prayer is for those in this room whose hearts feel heavy, burdened, who feel like their heart is broken into a million little pieces. I pray that you and you alone will bring joy and peace. We thank you that our hope is in you. We trust you for that. And we thank you for it. And God, my prayer is that all of us, not just today, but in these coming weeks, will surround the Bates family with unbelievable love. It's really easy to be there immediately, but my prayer is over these next few weeks, months, and years that we'll continue to show up and we'll continue to love in the way that we have felt love from Aaron and AJ. We thank you for it, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Ryan, if you'll escort the family out, I'm gonna ask the band to join us. As they do this, would you stand all across this room? Would you stand? Band, if you'll join me on stage. And as the band begins to play, you will be dismissed to meet the family out in the lobby. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you, everyone.